This is the Influencers in Accounting podcast. I'm thrilled to have with me today, back for the second time, Michael Quigley. Good day to you, Michael. Good day to you. Hi, Rob. Michael, we've had a conversation with you on motivation in accounting. For people that haven't checked that one out, would you just summarize that interview for us? What are some of the key things that came out for why accountants need to be motivated these days and how they do it? Sure. Uh, Well, one of the things we said was the changing world, modern adapting pace. And if people want to be their best selves and achieve massive success, they need to be internally motivated, not rely on other people. Second thing was we talked about having a process. So your motivation is not an infrequent feeling. It's more a repeatable process. And then we went into some real life examples of how you can use motivation throughout your day, throughout your week and why you should make the effort to do so. Super. We're going to talk about communication today. In the accounting world that you work in extensively, what have you noticed about how super smart, technically brilliant people like accountants, CPAs, bookkeepers actually communicate? It's really interesting because there's, there's two aspects. There's obviously online and then there's kind of face to face. Sure, so that's the world that, we're in, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. So, you know, in terms of emails, that's how you might be speaking to your clients or internally. What I've found is that accountants are starving for face-to-face contact. They love talking to people because they, they spend do? so much time on a screen, so much time in internal communications with that Slack, with that email. So when they get the opportunity to get together, to network, to see clients face-to-face, to go visit clients, they love it. And all their kind of, you know, the people side of them gets to flourish really. Accountants having a people side is not a phrase <laughs> that we hear a lot because accountants work in the world of risk, hmm. technical, data, numbers, audits, authority, that kind of world. And they tend to be more introverted by nature. I'm generalizing, of course. So when you tell us that accountants crave for real life contact with people, I'm guessing what you mean is that's where the most meaningful work often comes. That's where they're making a difference. And that's where they can bring out all of the good things that they do. Have I reading that right? Yeah, absolutely. I don't mean that they're, you know, they're jumping around, hugging each other all the time. What I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, what I mean is you know, accountants, like all of us, we're human beings and we need that balance. Because like you say, if you are working on a certain aspect and it's really technical and you're getting stuck in it, but you can then go once a quarter and see the man or woman that you're working for and remember the organizational needs and the culture and all the good that the work you're doing is, it really motivates people so that those numbers become a lot more meaningful because they can attach faces and, and names to the data. That's a good point, making the numbers more meaningful. We know that accountants produce the data. Historically, they look back and report on what has happened. And the data can be quite dry. It is just a set of numbers, a balance sheet, a profit and loss account. But there is an art, perhaps, or a skill or a talent or a capability or competence in communicating what they know in a much better way, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's a framework, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, which I've I've used with clients. And I don't even remember where I learned it, but it was brilliant. So get your data in order. You've got to have your data. Get your automation in place. That leads to insights. Then that leads to foresights. And the value added is obviously the insight and the foresight. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a multi-step complicated world, isn't it, being an accountant and trying to get what you need from your clients. However, it's stages three and four where they really get the value because you're able to say, you do realize this is for this reason. You do realize this is the way this is going to go. Have you considered this? You know, have you considered this? And as a business owner who works with accountants, when my accountant says that to me and I've had account, they provide some real value, real, real value. They might help you to see something you've never seen before. And that's, don't even if you give that as a free piece of advice, don't underestimate just how helpful that can really be. And it's not just accountants talking to the clients. Accountants these days, they work their way up the food chain. If you like the career ladder, they become managers, directors, partners leaders bosses whatever that is so they're communicating to their own staff and their peers and even people above them and that takes a certain skill set it does i mean one of the hardest things in management is you get really good at your job and then you so they make you a manager which is a completely (laughs) different job to what you're doing so you know you're a senior auditor and then you suddenly have a team of seven it's like in the sales world you're really good at selling so they make you ahead of the sales team and you don't know how to the worst thing you can do yeah sorry (laughs) yeah you're right it's the worst thing you can do but but it's true it's something i've got with uh financial planners insurance people conveyance and solicitors lawyers and accountants they'll have a caseload a fee earning thing that brings in money and then they'll have all this stuff they consider as extra i've got these you know extra problems you know but they don't realize that that is the nature of it. You know, leadership is very challenging. That's why I do a lot of work with leaders because leadership can be lonely and difficult. You suddenly get promotion, you work so hard, and then suddenly 
you're not one of the team anymore. You feel a bit separate to them and you've been put into a whole new kind of goldfish bowl and sometimes you struggle to swim. Mm. Well, let's create some kind of a burning platform here, Michael. We did it with our interview on motivation and we asked you what happens to the accountants that don't take motivation seriously and don't develop that intrinsic way of driving yourself. So let's yeah. talk about the accountants that either are unable or unwilling to develop their communication skills. What does the future look like for them? It looks very lonely and very isolated. So what I like to do with words, especially in English, is I like to look at what a word actually means. So if you think about um, communication, <clears throat> excuse me, and we think about words like communion and community, what it actually means is to be close to people. Right. So one of the best ways to be close is send a quick email. Even better is face to face. And what will happen to people who aren't good communicators is they won't be able to adapt what they say and what that how that's interpreted by the clients, by the people, and they'll be left alone. You know, I looked at the original uh, meaning of the word idiot, <clears throat> and it means somebody who can't relate to anybody else. They stand alone. Hmm. And that's not what you want in business, is it? You want to be connected to people. Um, and so that is one of the things. I was just reading an audiobook, listening to an audiobook recently, and they're talking about the difference from 200 years ago. People were obsessed with the written word, and now it's the visual image. And if you can't make that shift in how you're able to articulate things, for example, through a podcast that's visual as well as audio, you're going to be left behind. You know, your audience is going to change. And like we said before, not what they need necessarily, but how you phrase it, like you say, how you make the data and the numbers meaningful for them, that has to change. Because I always say to people, if I say it and you don't get it, that's my fault. However, if you say it and they get it, that's your success. Mm. And very often how many times do you have people say i sent an email they've still not done it they don't understand this it might be that you need to improve the way you phrase things or the way you say things you know uh, and that's something i'm i'm a reflective practitioner by the way i'm always trying to get better at that so something to I, consider i coined a phrase back in my consulting days called the law of one step removed which describes the phenomenon where in this day and age people take a step back from the primary line of communication. What I mean by that is people, when they should pick up the phone, then send an email instead. And when they yeah. should send an email, they'll send a text. Sure. And when they should go and meet somebody for lunch, they'll just pick up the phone. So they take a step back from what should be done. When they should meet for dinner, they just meet for a quick coffee. So yeah. they go one step removed from what should be done because it's safer, it's quicker, it's more convenient but it also hinders your communication a little bit. You haven't got that richness of the next level up. Absolutely. That's a really good idea, by the way, because what you're doing there is you're valuing yourself rather than the other person. One of the best things I ever got given as a piece of advice to be a trusted advisor and that person people go to is lower your level of self-orientation. Like you just mm. said, there. it might be more convenient for you to send an email. Have, a, have you thought about what it'd be like for the client? You know, and so you're absolutely right on that. And yet it's more effort. But you've got to balance that out and have a medium to long term view and say, yeah, but we only see this client, you know, this period or it is worth the effort for these reasons. It's back to that thing of is it easier and better for you or is it easier and better for the client or for your team? Sure. Accountants as a breed love techniques. They love prescriptive frameworks, processes of doing things. Have you got any good techniques that they might use to be a, a more skilled communicator? Sure, I got loads. I give the first one. It's what I call a synopsis. So anytime you're trying to describe something difficult to somebody, try use your knowledge and prep beforehand to explain it in one sentence. So you can start small. You know, you can say like a, a film. You know, what's that film about? The series I have practice with it because if you can say it in one sentence, it's going to be simple. Therefore, it's going to be memorable. Therefore, it's going to be actionable. So for example, he's talking to a client. You need them to do something for their tax return. You say it's this. All right, I've got that. I can go do that. So synopsis is the first one that I give. It's, it's quite an easy one as well. And it's a challenging one as well because you, you're letting go and I don't need that. I don't need to say that. I don't need to. That's the most important thing they need to know. I'm reminded of the quote by Jack Welch, former CEO of GE, General Electric, <clears throat> who said, any idiot can make something more complex. Yeah. Explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old or, or don't come into my office. Yeah, absolutely. And, and accountants when, are the experts. They've got all the answers. They want that authority. They want to be seen as having all of the knowledge. So they often elaborate and talk too much about things and don't make a synopsis. It's true. It's like any te we say any teacher that has to say I'm in charge is not in charge. It's the same mm -hmm. thing. Isn't it? If you have to feel like you have to demonstrate your authority to somebody, you don't really have the authority you think you do. <laughs> it's yeah. like, relax, you've done your qualifications. You're, you know, you've got all that going for you. Just, you know, focus on the other person. Give us another technique, Michael. 
one of the most challenging things for people in business is when people well, and life is people take things way too personally. So you're a manager delivering feedback to staff. You're uh, speaking to one of your clients and tell them they need to do something to improve. You're speaking to yourself. People take things way too personally. So there's a technique that I created called separation. And what you do is you give off the vibe at all times that the person you're dealing with is brilliant, but the behavior is not. Because we internalize and we say, we are what we do. If I do something great, I'm great. If I do something bad, I'm bad. But everybody makes mistakes on the data sheet. Everybody sleeps in. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody make, gets COVID. Things go wrong. And so what you do is you say things to people like this. You're great. It's just this particular report. You're fantastic. It's just this error. You know, we were talking off camera. You've got some things that you can do to help to improve me. Fantastic. Right. I'm not going to say Michael as a person sucks. <laughs> we're saying you're great. Have you thought about this to improve? And what that does is people relax more. When I've had clients use it, they've had people say things like, oh, so you're not going to fire me or oh, so it's not a massive deal. Mm. And it, from a communication point of view, a lot of leadership people say, well, I've, I've delivered it really well, the feedback or whatever, but the person's taking it really personally, which is not what you meant. And therefore, you know, you don't get the results. So separate it out. Person's great, but the behavior is not. Help them to see that and you, the results, the improvements can be absolutely massive. And that makes perfect sense. Are there certain phrases, questions, sentences, words that people like accounting professionals should avoid? Yes, two, um, which I was actually using with a client of mine, accountants and uh, client. So shout out to DJH Mitten Clark in Stoke, fantastic company. And we were talking about building rapport with people. And one of the worst ones to say is, oh, I understand. Because what you're really trying to say there is, I want to understand. I'm here for you. You know, but we don't understand. If one person's had COVID, you don't know what it's like for them to have COVID. You, you might be an accountant who doesn't run a business. You don't know what it's like to be someone who's run a business for 20 years. So I'd say try and avoid that. Instead, instead say something like, well, what's that like for you? How do you feel? What's going on with that? It's a lot better than assuming that you understand. And the second one, which is actually was, was from one of the people I was teaching, she said, I hate it when somebody says, I know how you feel, because you don't know how I feel. You know, Better, again, like we're saying about lowering self-orientation, better to say, how is that for you? How does that make you feel? How does that affect your goals? What impact has that had for you? You know, um, you can say things like I can, you know, I, I can. In fact, I'd always say to people, I can't understand. Tell me more. Or I want to understand. Can you tell me more? Tell me more is a brilliant phrase. It's a very open ended one. It's very soft. It's very gentle. But it helps that person to feel that you're really trying to listen to them properly. Mm. Another phrase I've encouraged many accountants over the years to stop saying is you're welcome. <laughs> because there are so many occasions in which an accounting professional goes above and beyond they do something amazing and the client or even one of their team is full of praise or admiration or just thankfulness appreciation and they say thank you that's amazing you've done a great <laughs> job there you've really pulled out the stops and the accountant says you're welcome or something like well that's what we do yeah and it takes all of the euphoria out of the situation and yes. gives the gives the implication that, well, that's what we do. We do that for anyone. You're not special. I really didn't go out of my way. I really didn't call in lots of favors. I really didn't pull out the stops there. So a better phrase to say instead of you welcome is, I'm really glad you said that. Yeah. We pulled everything in for that one because you're one of our most important clients. And I'm sure you do the same for me. Yeah. yeah. So turning it around with a better phrase that you perhaps might get in your head in advance but you deliver it naturally in the moment yeah because what you've said there you're absolutely right it's back to that thing of you've stolen that moment from that person it's like i always say a lot of english people not everybody but a lot of english people can't take a compliment if somebody takes makes the effort to give you a compliment you know receive it thank you very much mm. great. really appreciate that as opposed to oh no no tell me more you know so you're absolutely right if somebody's really appreciates the work that you've done allow them to say that to you and for it to be a special moment for them because what you do there is you're, you're what, what I call normalizing success. You want those moments to be as normal as brushing your teeth, you know, but they understand it's special to them. But to yourself, you're like, yeah, I want as many of those of my clients as I can. Mm. Yeah. We're talking a little bit about scripts here, Michael. And what I mean by that <clears throat> is the right thing said at the right time, delivered in a natural way, but actually prepared in advance. Now, we don't want to make accountants robots, no. but there is value, isn't there, in having the right thing to say because – the worst time to think of the best thing to say is actually as you're saying it. So talk to us a little bit about a reframing of scripts. Sure. I think one of the most important things is to, is to say, to have two things in mind before you talk to anybody or just, you know, when you're liaising with people is what do they actually need? What's their long-term goal? 
you know um the second is to always stay calm and con in, in control no matter what is said you know if the client gets um frustrated or exasperated or somebody's upset especially if you're in a leadership position you know i would write that down staying calm i can't think of a single communication that's improved by somebody getting angry or upset you know another thing that i would do is to say what is the action point you want to be taken by the end of this communication you know is it at the end of the email is it at the end of the phone call you know um another one that i would suggest is for you to say to yourself set your own standard and say i need to understand what's going on in this communication by the end of it and if i don't i will ask one of the best things i've found with people is clarification if you say to somebody can i just check can i just clarify i don't know many people that respond badly to that what they really hear is you you really want to understand you've been listening and you demonstrate that but you really want to understand so you can help me properly you know so it's understanding that their needs all that beforehand what does it look like beforehand you know what the um the outcomes that you want but in in the moment allowing yourself almost like at a midway point to say if i'm really not understanding this at the level i need to i'm just going to ask them if i can clarify something because then the conversation might go off into a much better direction of course beyond what we've said are there any other common <laughs> problems with communication that you see in people like accountants one of them is making assumptions we if we work with people uh clients or team members for years one of the worst things we can do is stop listening <laughs> we either we either zone out when they're talking or we've been including an email chain for 15 responses. We go, yeah, 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 I know what's going on. We don't. We've got to come with a fresh mind, you know, and look at that properly. So that's one of the biggest things that I think a lot of people make mistakes with is the longer they work with somebody, sometimes the more assumptions they make about them, either positively or negatively. And if we drive that back to the data, like we said before, that can skew the way you look at things. So say you have a really reliable client who's actually been a lot more erratic and they've been, you know, doing some things they shouldn't have been doing. And you're like, yeah, I'm sure it'll be all right. It'll be fine. That's an assumption, isn't it? We don't know. There might have been a massive lifestyle change. We need to pick up the phone and talk to them. So that's the biggest one I say is never make assumptions. Always be ready to listen and learn fresh every single day. Mm. We come across people all the time that are very charismatic. They build rapport like that, instant chemistry. And it seems almost like they're born with it. Do <laughs> you subscribe to that, that you've either got it or you haven't? Or can we actually teach people to build rapport? I'd say everybody has is born with certain ways they are, genetically, environmentally. You know, we speak English. But I think the ability to build rapport 100% can be learned and taught because I've taught people right? and, oh. I've built, and I've built it myself. So there's loads of different ways. The first thing is asking open-ended questions. You know, what, when, who, why, which, if. <clears throat> Not yes or no closed questions. That feels kind of cold. It feels a bit bat in the ball. So, you know, what's the most important thing you're working on right now? what you're really excited about, you know, open-ended questions. Second thing is to mirror other people. If they're quite informal and quite, you know, casual, you'd be informal and casual. If they're a bit more formal, you match to that. Another way, especially if it's somebody you're brand new, you can demonstrate your knowledge, not dropping names, but you might drop a stat or repeat, oh, it's just a recent conference about that. Or da -da -da -da. Another one is they recognize they might not feel comfortable. Say it's a networking situation or a brand new meeting or a new day on the job. You can crack a joke. And you can make them feel comfortable. And the last thing is um, be interested in the other person and be confident in that. So I'll give an example, a very quick example. I was speaking at a conference in London. A woman walked straight up to me and said, are you Michael? I said, yes. She said, nice to meet you and just stuck her hand out. So I looked her straight in the eye and just stuck her hand. You know, that built rapport with her very quickly. She's like, oh, I'm sure you'll be great. If I'd looked away from her, hadn't shook her hand, and, you know, she'd be thinking, who's this guy supposed to be, you know, a speaker at this event? So in that moment, I matched her. And we built rapport in seconds. We know each other years later, you know. So rapport um, is an interesting one. It can be built quite quickly, but there are many, many things. Again, it's, it all goes back to thinking, what does that person want? What does that person need? And can I try these different things to get to that point? You know, it's not a natural charisma that some people have got, that some people haven't. We said this before. That's a very misunderstood thing. And in a way, it's a cop-out to say, well, some people just like that. I can't be like that. How do you know until you've tried? Mm. And people are humans they're complex yeah. creatures wired up with all kinds of different motivators different senses of humor different skills different weapons are there different types of people that communicate well michael that's a really good question well we did talk about introverts and extroverts so for people yeah. who haven't heard that before it's very misunderstood so carl jung when he popularized the term just over 100 years ago an introvert is not a shy person an introvert is somebody who might love people but it tires them out 
they have to have time alone afterwards. I'm an introvert. I love people, but I need time away from them. extroverts are people who gain energy from other people. So they go to a networking event or they've been at a company event. They love it and they have more energy. So that's the first thing I'd say, rank yourself on a level of zero to 10 on introspection to extroversion. You know, would if you've got something important to do, do you need to do it in silence? Or would you be better off, you know, working at it, you know, surrounded by other people? I, th I think also as well, the second thing to do is I, I when you talk about types, I, I agree that you can you can typify people in many, many different ways. And psychologists and psychotherapists done it for over 200 years. I'd be more interested to say, like, what can this person teach me? What I, what could I learn from this person? Can I one of the best definitions I've ever heard of leadership was can you respond to that person in the moment with their needs, with whatever they've got? Can you just keep like a blank mind? And just respond to them. And to me, that's really, really interesting that because rather than saying, I am this kind of person and I need, I need to do it this way, you focus more on the other person and what they're like and say, well, with that person, I'm a bit more like this. And you can, I'm sure you can think about it. You think of work colleagues and you might be different to how you are with your partner, or how you are with your dog. You know, but it's still you. You just got that ability to match different parts of you to different contexts and different roles rather than thinking I am one way all the time. Because I've never met a person yet who's one way all the time in every aspect, or they're in the minority. We do like to put people in boxes, don't we? We have all kinds of psychometric tests and profiling, and we say, you are this kind of person, yeah. so you like these kind of things, <clears throat> and you will communicate in these kinds of ways. But it's as varied as there are people, surely. Absolutely. And again, it's something very I always say to people, that could have just been you on that day. You know, you take you take a Myers-Briggs, you take a colour personality says, Okay, but... I used to say this about teachers and, and children. A lot of parents would want a, a label for their child. I want my child to be known to, as having this. I say, okay. But the more important question is what are you going to do once you have that label? How are you going to provide for your child? It's the same thing. Once you know you are a J7 or you're a red, okay, what are you actually going to do with it? So you're absolutely right. The data, like we said before, data can be useful or, or not. It can be self-limiting. Mm -hmm. I'd more likely say, you know, how have you been in the last two years? Is that different to five years ago? Where are you going in the next five years? Because I don't know anybody who's the same at 18 as they were at five, and yet it's still the same person. So that's right. Very useful. Very good from an organizational point of view, managerial point of view. can be very helpful, but it's a tool, like every, like automation. You know, It's a tool to be used for particular results, not a self-fulfilling prophecy. Sure. We'll put your contact details in the show notes, Martin, so that firms, networks, associations, alliances that want to reach out to you to help them with these kind of things can do so. Thank Let's you. finish by asking, what about the people on the other side of communication, the receivers mm -hmm. that are having to deal with challenging communication, challenging behavior, people that can't communicate very well? And let's sure. face it, there are a lot of those in accounting <laughs> practices. Yeah, uh, there's a technique that I use now, just use a couple of examples from it. It's called the fence. So think about like you have a physical fence, you know, so you're, you're receiving an email or something like that. And once you've internalized it, you've taken it too close and, you know, that person shouts at me, whatever, it's hard to deal with. What suggestion said is have some phrases where you like, you don't let anybody pass that particular barrier. OK, so an example, a really good example of that is that's not possible because. All right. So someone said, well, it has to be done today in 24 hours. You say, OK, true. That's not possible because this person has COVID. That's not possible because we haven't received this, this thing from you. That's not possible because, you know, having phrases like that, that, like we said before, that you can prep beforehand so that you've got a list of them. And the moment it's what I call yellow flag. The moment anybody starts to get particularly aggressive or you know, people can be, you know, as they are, you say, aha, this is a chance to use that to use one of these phrases and to have that prep. So that's not possible because we can't do that right now for these reasons, you know, they're really good things. And what I'd also say with that is document that. So for example, you've got a particular client who's been quite aggressive on four emails and you've got proof of it. That might be a safeguarding issue going forward. There might be a concern where that person oversteps the line, you know, and if you can go to your manager and go, uh, this has been happening on these dates and I've got it here. They say, well, thank you very much. You know, you've done a really good thing. They kept a paper trail. So what I say with those things, it's like we said before, just a little bit of prep. You can do 20 minutes on a Sunday and you say, right, with these clients, I'm going to have these little phrases and I'm going to try it to keep a bit of professional distance. They work very, very well. I've used them for about 10 years. Yeah, I love that idea. Another phrase I use a lot is when people are passing off their opinions as fact, <laughs> I say to them, it can be slightly confrontational, but it's standing your ground and saying, well, how do you know that? Or what's your evidence for that? Absolutely. Or is that actually the case? So you're then starting to hold them accountable for their claims. And if they haven't got anything to back it up beyond an opinion, 
then you can start to challenge it and maybe look for some different solutions. How does that sound to you? It sounds very useful because opinions can change throughout the day. You know, I don't remember what I was thinking 17 weeks ago, but I remember <laughs> some data and I remember some, but like I said, back to process, you're absolutely right. So if it's something that's challenging, you can say, okay, um, can you tell me where where's that shown in the business? How is that the case? For how long has that been going? Is that a long-term trend or is that a one-off thing? And again, people very quickly will ask, well, um, um, I'm, I'm, you know, it's just my opinion. So you're absolutely right. People can have any opinion they want. I'm more interested in insights, you know, things that have happened, whether it's anecdotal or physical evidence or whatever that is. We did this for this reason. I think this for this reason. I think this because this has happened. And here's an example of that. It's very easy to just give an opinion. Yeah, this is great, Michael. Uh, leave us with a call to arms, if you like, a, a message of inspiration to the accountants listen to raise their game in the area of commu communication. Let me ask that question again. <laughs> Our editors will bring that out. This has been great, Michael. Leave us with a few words of encouragement to those accountants listen that really want to raise the game with communication. Sure, I'll give you a very quick example. So my father's Irish, and there's a phrase called Foucher Rohet. And what that means is, You've got a place where you feel safe. I've got a place where I feel safe. I don't expect you to come to me in my communication and you shouldn't expect you, me to come to you. Let's come into the middle and find a shared safe space, third space, where we can do some really good stuff together. That sounds great. Michael Quigley, that's been inspirational. Thanks for your time today. Thank you very much.